One of Us is Back, written by Karen McManus, read by Brittany George. Chapter 9, Mate, Sunday, July 5th. We should have our half-birthday party here, Addie says, tapping my arm. Huh? I gaze around the back room of Cafe Conigo where a large green TV has been set up so we can watch Cooper's game commercial. Right now, it's a show of Padre's game, but the commercial is supposed to be air after the fifth inning. What half-birthday party? You know, where we always have a joint birthday party in March? Addie asks twice. I say, we did that twice. Technically, Addie did it. We were both born in March, so she decided during the last semester of high school that we should throw a party on the midpoint between our birthdays. She organized the whole thing at her apartment, and I showed up because it meant a lot to her, and there aren't many people I like better than Adelaide Prentice. Plus, I learned a long time ago that there's no point in resisting Addie when she's in a social, social director mode. Then she did the same thing this year, although it was more of a subdued since Brandon Weber had recently died. Right, so it's a tradition, Addie says, but this year wasn't that all that celebratory, so I thought, what about a half-birthday party in mid-September? No, that's too late, Brandon protests, exacting the only tortilla chip untouched by any kind of topping from the platter of nachos in front of us. I'll be back by school that, by then. Oh, right, we can't do August because I'll be in Peru, so July 14th it is, Abby decides decisively. It will be like one-third birthday party. That's not a thing, I say. Abby ignores me. We should invite all the usual suspects, she says, waving a hand around us. We're at a single table ringed by nine chairs, and all of them are filled with me, Abby, Bronwyn, Cooper, Chris, Maeve, Louise, and Knox, except for one. Phoebe's not here, even though we were all supposed to show up half an hour ago. Perfect, Bronwyn says, but it's not just us, right? I want to invite Kate and Yumiko, and Evan, maybe. She trails off and shoots me a sideways glance, or not. Whatever, I shrug. I can be monogamous about her ex when he has no shot. She squeezes my arm. This room might not have enough space for everybody. Well, there's always Nate's house, Addie says. No way. I can't help the ed irritated edge that creeps into my voice. You might be able to force me into have a one-third birthday party, but you can't force me to spend it babysitting Reggie Crawley. Absolutely not, Bronwyn says quickly. We tried to restart the Reggie discussion with Sana last night, but even Bronwyn had to admit that we weren't getting anywhere. Ultimately, it wasn't the time or place, but it kind of pissed me off when Sana admitted that she hadn't even looked at the link to Katrina's video that Bronwyn sent her, because that would have been bare minimum for taking the problem seriously. Okay, yeah, fair enough, Addie says. Then she tugs on her earring, a classic Addie anxiety move, as she gazes at the beaded curtain that separates the back room from the main restaurant. Last night was a mess, wasn't it? And not only because of Reggie. She tugs harder. You guys, do you think Phoebe's coming? It was kind of hard on her. You were upset, Bronwyn says. I was, but Addie bites her lip. I keep thinking about what I said to her when she said that she didn't thank Jake for changing her tire. I was super mean and sarcastic, and the thing is, that's almost exactly how Drake cheated me. Way back when I was tried to apologize for cheating on him with TJ, he said, That's alright then, as long as you're sorry. From the way she says it, the words, I can tell they're imprinted on her brain. You have to give people a chance to explain, right? But I didn't. I grasp the edge of the table and keep myself from making a cutting remark about Phoebe that I know deep down she doesn't deserve. Letting someone change your tire isn't the end of the world, except it's Jake. Walking around town playing the good guy like the past never happened. Anyone in Bayview who's ever been caught up in this town's sick dynamic shouldn't give him anything except a punch to the face. The situations are in no way sim similar, Bronwyn says, which is a more polite way of saying the same thing. Yeah, they're different because what I did to Jake was worse, Addie says, or it would have been if he was a decent human. I tried texting Phoebe ear I tried texting Phoebe earlier, but she left me unread. Knox, who's sitting beside Maeve on the other side of the table, twists in his chair. Wait, are you guys talking about Phoebe? He asks. She hasn't texted me back either. I gave her a ride to the party last night and she just like disappeared. Didn't she leave with jewels? Maeve asks. No, I say. Everyone stares at me, probably because this isn't the kind of thing I tend to notice. That loser boyfriend of hers was too wasted to drive, so Crystal took his keys and made them leave with somebody else. Phoebe wasn't there. Addie digs her fingernails into her palms. I hope she got home okay. I wouldn't worry so much, but Ashton's gotten me all worked up about that billboard. Guys, Louise calls from the other end of the table. Pay attention. That was the second out. The inning might be over soon. 
Abby ignores him. I wish we were... I wish we knew what those revenge forearm guys were up to now, she says, looking pointedly at Maeve, who doesn't notice because she's doing the supportive girlfriend thing by staring at the television, television screen almost as hard as Louisa's. Maeve's working on it, Bronwyn says. Give her time. The billboard's gone right back to dancing energy drink, I say. I'd notice it on the ride here with a sense of relief. Guess they fixed the hack. On the TV screen, the capacity crowd roars with a disappointment as the batter hits a foul ball into the stands. This guy's timing is way off, Louise says, leaning forward intensely. He's going to pop up in a second. You, just you wait. Oh, God. Cooper, who's sitting up front with Chris, rubs both hands across his face. I'd just like to remind everyone that I'm not an actor, and I wouldn't even have done this except my car's on its last leg, so... Cooper, you work harder than anyone I've ever known, and you deserve to be recognized for that, Chris says, and paid for it. Don't you dare apologize. You say that now, Cooper mutters, but his shoulders relax a little. I know he's been worried about taking any kind of sponsorship, afraid that companies want him only because of lingering Bayview for notoriety. And yeah, maybe that's part of it. None of us can ever rule it out fully, but he had a phenomenal freshman year. More than ever, he seems destined for a huge career, and he might as well get start getting paid for it. I wish Nani could have come. I love watching her cheer Cooper on, Addie says wistfully. Her phone starts buzzing on the table then, but before she can reach for it, Bronwyn snatches it up and puts it face down. Don't answer, she says. Louise or Zite, inning over. The screen fades to black and Louise calls, here we go. Maeve stretches him and a sleek gym interior appears with a huge logo for fired up fitness on one wall. Heavy bass kicks in as the camera pans to a workout machine, lockers in a bunch of weights, and then Cooper, running on a treadmill like his life depends on getting away as fast as possible. The room erupts into cheers so loud that we can't hear anything else for just a few beats. Which is fine, because the commercial is just one shot after another of Cooper working out, barely breaking a sweat while looking like a superhero. So far, I'm loving this, Chris says, as Cooper squats with a barbell across his shoulders on the screen. Then the music fades as Cooper puts down the weights, reaches for a towel, and turns towards the camera. Nothing gets me fired up like fitness, he says. There's a moment of stunned silence in the room, because that was easily the most wooden line that anyone's ever delivered. Cooper sounded like a robot programmed for English by someone who's never actually heard it spoken, but then we erupt into laughter cheers, because Cooper still rules, and that was weirdly iconic. Oscar! Oscar! Luis yells, or wherever they give you commercials! You look hot, Chris says, pulling Cooper towards him for a kiss. I hate working out, but you almost convinced me, Maeve says. Y'all are full of it, Cooper says, blushing, but he's smiling, too. After the excitement dies down and the game comes back on, Addie reaches for her phone. I wonder if that was Phoebe calling earlier, she says, before nearing her eyes at the screen. Huh? No, it was her mom. Phoebe's mom has your number? I ask as Knox turns in his seat. She was Ashton's wedding planner, remember? Addie says, lifting the phone to her ear. A frown crosses her face as she listens to the message. Okay, this is weird. Miss Lawton is asking if Phoebe's still with me because she's not answering her phone, which, I mean... She was never with me, exactly. We didn't go to the 4th fourth, fourth of July party together. Did her mom just call you? She adds, turning towards Knox. He pulls his phone, f brow furrowed. No, you should have called her back. On it, Addie says. She swipes at her phone and lifts it again, plugging one ear. Hi, Miss Lawton, she says after a few seconds. Phoebe's not, what? Her voice gets strained. No, she didn't. That was never, she what? What's happening? Knox says urgently. Addie waves him away. No, we're definitely at the party together, but we didn't make plans for her to stay over. I haven't seen her since last night. Did you try jewels? Her expression turns grave as she listens to whatever Phoebe's mother is saying on the other end. Yeah, for sure. Keep me updated, okay? When she lowers her phone, her face is ghost pale. Phoebe didn't come home last night, she said, staring around the room of around the ring of concerned faces. She texted her mom late to say that she was spending the night at my house. Why would she do that? Because she was staying someplace else that she didn't want her mother to know, Maeve suggests. Her eyes flick towards Knox, who has the same look on his face that he, he used to get when his dad, who's my boss at Myers Construction, didn't notice that he had stopped by the office, like he's crushed at pretending not to be. I don't think he, Phoebe would do that, he says tightly. If she did, I messed things up for her, Addie said with a grimace. But why hasn't she checked in with anyone yet? She missed the commercial. 
Try calling her, Bronwyn says. Abby does, but she's barely lifted her phone to her ear when she frowns and says, straight to voicemail. Maid has her phone out now, stabbing at the screen. I wonder if... Okay, her Snapchat location is on, and it says she's... She enlarges her screen and blinks at it a few times before holding it up to me. She's at your house, apparently? Really? I ask. She wasn't there when I left. At least, I don't think she was. I slept late, since I had a rare day off. I didn't leave my room until it was time to come here. Crystal and Sana were gone, and Jahu and Deacon were watching TV in the living room like usual. Reggie was, I don't have a clue where Reggie was, but his door was shut because at some point last night he'd managed to undo Shanna's sheet contraption. Oh no, Bronwyn says, like she's reading my mind. She couldn't be. She's not with Reggie, is she? No way, Maeve says. Phoebe would never. She's drinking a lot, though, Addie says wordly. Not that much, Maeve says, though she looks less sure. But even if she were, um, hanging out with Reggie at any point last night, she would have left by now. Unless he's not letting her, Louise says. Maeve punches his shoulder like she thinks she's making a bad joke, but there's not a trace of a smile on his face. That got dark fast. We better check on her, I say. Thanks for reading with me today. If you liked this video, make sure to like and subscribe.